Hey everyone, we're back with a new episode of Watch Talk. I'm Emily, here with Ripley and Justin, and today we are taking you through some beautiful watches that have just come in. Also, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on our latest video content. Now, before we get to these watches that you definitely don't wanna miss, I have to know what you guys are wearing on your wrist. So Justin, what have you got? I'll start. Today, I got the Deep Sea, the James Cameron with Ow. the blue. Yeah. Big watch kind of day. Yes, it is. Deep sea definitely checks the box. And Great watch <laughs> for like summer. It. Yeah, very good yeah. summer watch, yeah. What do you Love got? Uh, what are you wearing? I'm also on the summer vibes. Hey. We're kind of coming yeah. up on 4th of July, so I'm yeah. doing the Omega Planet Ocean America's Cup Edition. Yeah. Uh, Beautiful. Full America. <laughs> yeah. Love the red, white, and blue look. <laughs> yeah, really unique, uh, kind of striking dial and a ton of fun. I don't know a ton about regattas, but um, I like the watch. So. <laughs> the watch looks good. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm staying in my lane. I've got a gold Rolex President on today, 18038. Yes, it has the Romans. You know I'm kind of standard. All right, so to kick this off, we've got a Rolex GMT. Yes, this is a new one. Ripley, tell us about it. So not a new reference number, but a new mm -hmm. configuration for this reference. This is a 126710BLRO. Uh, so it's a steel Pepsi GMT with a ceramic bezel. As you can tell, this has an oyster bracelet. Woo! So this is new for 2021. Previously, the steel Pepsi GMT was only fitted with a Jubilee. Uh, now you can get it Oyster or Jubilee, and this is the very first Oyster bracelet version in steel that we've got. The long-awaited steel yeah. Oyster <laughs> bracelet. Yeah. Um, I like it. I like Oyster bracelets on these, um, and I think a lot of people like myself have been kind of waiting for that Oyster in something other than the white gold, mm -hmm. and uh, it's finally here, and I think it looks good. Even you know not being a yeah. new watch, I think the bracelet's a good combo with it. It's kind of nice that you have your choice now, too. So Absolutely. it's not like they've gotten rid of the Jubilee, which a lot of times Rolex will change. They discontinue something and bring yes. something new and then maybe go back to it. Now you actually have the choice of either at the same time, which I think is kind of nice. What's better than options when right. you're talking about watches? I mean, for me, I am definitely team Jubilee, but I go. love that everybody else gets kind of their chance to go to the Oyster. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you already had a, let's say a Batman on a Jubilee, this mm -hmm. is a great way of adding another GMT to your collection. That's not just the same watch with a different bezel color. It's it, it's a it's a you know yes. a more appreciably different overall package. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how demand of this falls compared to the Jubilee bracelet one, version. Uh, that one's been around for a few years. This is brand new. I know a lot of people prefer the Oyster, but I think a lot of people also are kind of warming up to the Jubilee. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see how things shake out. But I'm sure everyone's happy to have the choice. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a fun fun game of options for 2021. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm gonna go ahead and bring in our next watch. We've got a Rolex Daytona, not just any Daytona. Yes, this is a blue dial, white gold. Yeah, so the um, this is the white gold with a blue dial version of that mega, mega popular <laughs> yellow gold with the green dial version. Um, both came out in 2016, the same year that the steel bezel, uh, the steel Daytona with the ceramic bezel came out. Mm -hmm. um, so. This one's actually at retail more expensive than the yellow gold one with the green dial. Uh, mm. White gold and rose gold cost more from Rolex. So if you want the white gold or the ever rose gold Daytona, I think it's, unless you want a diamond dial, it's 39,350. Uh, yellow gold's 36,650. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a few thousand dollars more. Obviously that completely disappears on the pre-owned market. Um, but for those that can't get a yellow gold Daytona with a green dial, but want that sort of colorful, precious metal Daytona with the pop of red. This still has the pop of red, blue instead of green, white gold instead of yellow gold, and it's a bit more subtle. So it, it, as an everyday watch, I think this one does have the advantage as far as that. I agree. Uh, I was gonna say, I actually like the styling and look of this one better than yep. the yellow gold. I love the yellow gold, and I'd commented before that the yellow gold and green is such an amazing combination, and mm. um, you know, it's a beautiful watch, but this fits into more wardrobes and more situations. And I mean, a blue dial is, uh, a blue dial is great, right? It's classic and it's, it's that nice, um, you know, being different with a little bit of color without being too far outside the box. And um, I think this one's great. I think, you know, objectively, I like it better than the yellow gold version. And on the secondary market anyway, being at around half the price right now. Oh yeah. That's uh, another selling point for it. More regular wear for me on this one. I mean, the yellow, gold, and the green dial are just absolutely iconic to me, but I, this is just beautiful. Yeah, green's my favorite color, so I'm partial to that one, but as mm. far as just like ob objectively, this is a beautiful watch. It's also kind of one for those who know, um, you know, obviously Rolex only fits black or white dials to the steel models mm -hmm. and no longer produces even one with a steel bezel, but 
for the average watch person, just looking at the watch, it doesn't scream solid gold Rolex. Right. Yeah. Um, even the blue, it's, you know, it's kind of that sunburst pattern, but it's mm -hmm. not super bright and, you know, flat and, you know, vibrant and in yeah. your face. So it's a bit more understated. Um, but obviously the wrist presence when it's on, you, you feel that solid gold. It is. It's luxury, <laughs> but it's also really sporty. This one's, uh, uh, to me, a lot sportier than the gold one, right? Because it has, uh, you know, even though it's white gold, it still has that you know, kind of stainless, colorless, yeah. um, you know, on the bracelet and case. Is it the red accent? And then the color? red accents on the mm -hmm. subdials with the blue. It just seems, you know, like a little more sporty and a little more fun than yeah. the, um, you know, and then the yellow gold with the green. So um, to me, that's kind of what a, uh, a, day a Daytona is really. True. So, um, you know, I like it. I think it's an advantage and I think it's a great looking watch. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see this color profile kind of reflected in other Rolex watches. It's similar to what you'll find with the Relysium Yachtmaster. They also had the the last iteration, the Turnograph, which had a blue uh, dial with red accents. So it's interesting to see Rolex playing into this kind of red, white, and blue color motif um, more than you might expect for them otherwise. But personally, I think it looks good, so keep doing what works. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it does look good. Well. Speaking of watches that are standing out, we have a 2021 Rolex Explorer 2. This is a 2021 Another version. Another brand new. <laughs> yeah, brand I new think one, right, keeping with doing the stuff that works is probably this. We all thought there was going to be a big update to the Explorer 2 this year for the 50th anniversary. This is the new 2021 Explorer 2. It looks very, very similar to the previous one that it's existed for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously it has a different movement. It's got a little Rolex coronet mm -hmm. um, below the six o'clock marker. Right. I think the most noticeable aesthetic updates are the bracelet's a bit wider, which, you know, is accompanied by a wider clasp. Mm -hmm. Lungs have been thinned out a little bit. Um, text and font has a slightly different weight on the bezel and dial, but the hands and um, hour marker surrounds, which were previously gloss black, are now kind of a matte black texture. Yep. Other um, than that, largely the same. Yeah, and it's interesting, and a lot of those details are pretty subtle. You don't notice it, mm -hmm. you definitely don't notice it across the room, you probably don't notice it on your wrist right here. It's not until you really get up close and start looking at it, um, you know, kind of next to the previous yep. iteration that you see some of these details. Um, I don't know that I like them better or worse on the new ones. I think the matte hands are interesting. I'm not sure if I like them, you know, more than the gloss hands or I like the gloss hands better to me. I think I'm kind of indifferent on them. Um, I do like that it's a 22 millimeter uh, lug width now. Mm -hmm. So in terms of straps, I mean, you know, what like we were talking about before, 21 millimeters is kind of a difficult size to find straps. There's just not as many options. Mm -hmm. 22 is a lot more standard. So I appreciate that from Rolex, that update. Yeah, I um, I think for me, actually, I almost prefer the older version. I've got such small wrists as it is that the uh, 42 millimeters really on the larger side. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that thinner bracelet with a bit steeper taper. Mm -hmm. um, but really, I think for anyone with a slightly larger wrist than mine, you'd be hard pressed to kind of tell the difference. It's most noticeable at the clasp on the bottom there. It is most noticeable on the clasp. And I mean, it was a great watch before. Um, I know some people really like this watch. I know people that really don't like it. Personally, I think it's a great looking watch. Um, you know, I wear it often and um, I think that the updates are nice. Like I said, it's not a huge change, but it's appreciated. Absolutely. This is just a great watch Yeah. before and now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think it's kind of hitting at the right time. For a number of years, the Explorer 2 as a whole was very underrated, and you could get it for a steep discount compared to a lot of its sports watch siblings. Um, that's very much changed in recent years. It's mm -hmm. right up there with the rest of the models. And now with this new one coming out, obviously it's not going to be something you're able to get at retailers. It's a steel sports watch. Um, but at the same time, I'm thrilled that they kept the steel bezel. That is the defining characteristic of the Explorer mm -hmm. 2 for me. Sure. And um, I just don't feel the watch would have been the same if they'd gone ceramic or other. So um, I'm happy to see it the same. I would have loved to see it smaller, but I think the change, the altered proportions around the lugs and the end links, I think for people with a larger wrist, this will wear a bit more balanced than the older. Yeah, one. it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. It's not shrunken down by any means, but it is, you know, nudged a little more to that to that size and comfort and wearability. Yeah, it's a great watch. I'm excited that we got a chance to kind of review this one too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go ahead and bring in our next watch. We've got a blue dial, sky dweller, beautiful white gold roll sore, Yes. Yeah, white gold bezel, uh, stainless steel case and bracelet. So this is the most steel Sky Dweller, but it's also the um, most desirable one. It's crazy how much more expensive the blue dial is than its wider black dial mm -hmm. counterparts on the open market. Still now several years after it's been released. 
Uh, also, just like the GMT, this watch is now available with either an Oyster or Jubilee bracelet. Yep. This is obviously the Oyster variety, but um, again, between the blue dial and now the option, I wouldn't be surprised to see the heat surrounding the blue dial variants just continue to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, blue dials are always popular. I mean, it's it's uh, you know it's a great color. I mean, I chose one for for today, <laughs> so you know that speaks to my opinion. So I, I think it's great. Um, I like the Skydweller line as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I love the the complications. Um, I love the way Rolex yeah. has done it and engineered it. It's just um, it just feels so advanced and so high end and luxury um, that uh, and there's not nothing else that really. Um, kind of looks like it or acts like it. So sure. it's definitely kind of a standalone piece. Um, I think the blue's gorgeous and you can't go wrong. And it did take a while to catch on with people. When the Sky Roller first came out, it was only in solid gold. Uh, so it was kind of cost prohibitive for certain people, but mm. also it does such a good job of hiding its complexity that the full capabilities are kind of missed at first glance. You're like, oh, there's a ring around the dial and it's a, you know, it's still got three hands, whatever. But it doesn't, it's not immediately apparent that it, it's a G D GMT functionality. It's an annual calendar complication. Yes. You're only going to need to reset it once a year. The bezel links the internal movement. There's a lot going on with it on a technical level. And the way that Rolex integrates it is so well done and so seamless that I think for the average person looking at it, unless they really dig, dig deep into the tech specs, mm -hmm. it almost kind of undersells itself. Um, but clearly not within the enthusiast community because you simply can't get this watch at retail. So those who appreciate it really do and you know it continues to remain unavailable but um, I think part of the reason why it took so long to catch on was simply that it doesn't, you know, look at the Daytona, you see three registers, this doesn't look as busy um, but does so much more. Exactly. It's, um you know, it's very simple and complicated at the same time, which mm -hmm. is not easy to do. And you start seeing these little things on it, like, you know, the first time I saw it, I really liked the watch, didn't notice the month indicator until a little bit, and then, and then you start seeing these things come through and you think, oh, that's a nice touch, that's really well done. And, you know, this watch is just full of those without being, you know, having the dial crammed full of every single um, little complication or everything they could yeah. find somewhere to squeeze in. It's still really well balanced and really well designed and clean and luxurious. And um, this one knocks it out of the park for me. Would Love you, uh, now that you, it's available on Oyster I Jubilee, was... would you take the Oyster or the Jubilee? Now we're getting into the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd say in general, I like Oyster better. However, I'm a big fan of Jubilee, especially the new ones. Um, I might go Jubilee on this one. Um, it's a little, uh, um, a little more luxury, and I think that the Jubilee yeah. is a little more of a luxury bracelet. Yeah. And you know, while I'll probably choose the uh, Oyster on the GMT that we just looked at, I'd probably choose Jubilee here. Yep. I would need to think? try on the Jubilee. So the Jubilee has a little bit more play being a five link versus three link design. It's a bit more mm -hmm. delicate of a bracelet and the Skydweller is a pretty uh, hefty watch. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's not small, but it's also a bit thick. And so I'd want to see how the balance, if it, that's changed at all. I think right now on an Oyster bracelet, it's superbly wearable. Mm -hmm. But I just want to know if it maintains that exact same wearability when you move it over mm -hmm. to the Jubilee. Sure. I imagine it would, it's Rolex. Right. Um, but one of those things I'd want to make sure and you know, we'll be excited to get one in. So you, you can't figure go wrong out once way. you tried it on. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll try it okay. out and we'll yeah. try it on then decide, yeah. but I'll reserve my opinion for now. <laughs> well, you could always get two and then you don't have to really make that decision once. You can just on a daily basis choose which you like better and be good I, to I go. like that approach yeah, the best. Why good. decide? Right. <laughs> I'm easy on this one. Jubilee for me. Yeah. It's just more of a dressy kind of standout watch for me. So Jubilee just adds to it, right? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I'm with you. Well, you guys, let's bring in our last watch. We've got a Submariner 5512. Yes, this has a nice little reflection on it from that domed crystal. Ripley, tell us about it. So the 5512 is a really important reference in the Submariner's history. For a lot of people, it's the quintessential vintage Submariner. It came out in 1959 and mm -hmm. introduced a 40 millimeter case and crown guards to the collection, which it, up until that point, neither of those two things were part of it. So. Uh, previous Submariners look way different than this one, which, you know, for the most part, kind of has a similar overall aesthetic to the ones that are still produced today, obviously with some changes. Uh, this particular model is from 1961, so it's a pretty early iteration of it. It's got a gilt chapter ring dial with a tulipano coronet, which is uh, indicative of, you know, mm -hmm. this production range. This just, if you're, you know, it's a four-line dial, um, so it's with two different colors of printing, so the um, Submariner so name at the top versus the chronometer uh, certification. It's one's gold and gilt versus mm -hmm. um, the silver printing, which was done later. So there's a lot of really interesting details of this dial that help make it unique and grounded in its era. 
Um, but that type of variation is something that you just don't find today. If you look at one no date Samariner and the next, they are almost identical with the exception of their serial number engravings. And in this area, you see variation from one year to the next and even within a single year. Sure. And so it's like a it's micro time capsule. And within that time capsule, this is the vintage Samariner reference to own, in my opinion. It, it's 40 mil, it's got the crown guards, but it's you know no date, gilt dial, chapter ring, uh, chronometer certified movement. So it's a 5512 is quite a bit more rare than the 5513. Um, so it's kind of a, a grail sub if you're not going for a 50s model. Yeah, definitely a grail sub. Um, I love this one. I love the gilt dials. Um, and I'm always a fan of no date versus date. It's just kind of one of my personal things. I love no dates. Um, and this is a great example of it. Um, it's clean, like you said. It's that little micro time capsule where, um, you know, Rolex used to make changes within the same reference um, fairly often. And Nowadays, like you said, it's just with the way things have evolved, they don't. They change the reference, um, maybe change you know a very small thing here or there. Yeah. But uh, back then, you know, you could really date, pin down like the date of a watch or, or the generation of it by these little changes. And I think it's kind of a fun little detail on you know vintage watches that have so much of a story. It's nice to include that. It's not just a fifty-five twelve. It's a very specific fifty-five twelve. Um, and this one's great. I would love to own it. I could definitely call it a Grail watch. Yeah, and it's one that's beat the odds, too. I mean, one thing to remember is that anyone buying a Submariner today is aware that it is a premium item. It's an expensive item. Um, but, you know, in 1961, when this watch, we, we, you know, was created, uh, this 5512 was not a statement piece. It wasn't a luxury item. It was just a very high-end piece of professional diving gear. And so they weren't babied. They were used for their purposes. They were used underwater, saw professional use. Many were damaged, lost, broken, flooded. Uh, and so to find one that still has its original Original dial uh, and in, you know let alone in this condition is kind of special because it's not just this rare item that only existed for this fleeting moment in time it's also one that then was able to exist for half a century without having anything happen that was going to compromise that so it's it's a little bit special in that regard too of just beating the odds alone. Absolutely. It's a, a testament to the watch and to Rolex on, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it was a different time. Watches were treated differently back then. I mean, it was still an expensive watch and it was still, uh, you know, a luxury to own, but it wasn't like it was today, which is more of a jewelry piece than a tool piece. Mm -hmm. Back then it was more of a tool piece. And, um, you know, a lot of them, like you said, didn't survive or, you know, or in very poor condition or had things changed over the years. Dials ended up getting changed out or get, getting flooded or bezels being lost and all those things. Um, so so yeah, to find an example like this that you know really tells the story and has survived as long as it has and been in the great shape, um, yeah, it's just just really a nice watch. Yeah, and this watch would not be the same thing if it had a service dial. So if it had flooded and had gone back to Rolex and had its original dial and hands replaced, this wouldn't be the same thing. We wouldn't be discussing it today. So it really is this piece as a unique standalone piece, not just any fifty-five twelve, but sure. this exact one. Yeah, um, and you know the nature of vintage watches is such that no two examples are going to be alike. Right. So you might find an identical, near identical one and just the way it's worn, aged, discolored over the years is going to be a bit different. So um, for those that want that kind of, that wabi-sabi, the, yeah, yeah. this is perfect. They have that, you know, that uh, individuality and, you know, and that's kind of the charm of a vintage watch. I mean, it's not yeah. just the watch. It's a lot of the story and history that has come along with it. And um, this one's got a great story and it's a really good example. It really is. Well, we've made it through our five favorites of the week. Now I'm curious what your guys' single-handed favorite of these are. I'll let Ripley so, go first. I was going to say, Ripley, why don't you kick us off this week? Um, well, for me, I love the wearability of modern Rolex watches. They are, you know, you can buy them, wear them every day, not have to worry about it. Um, but for me, I want that piece that I would never be able to get again. Um, I can put my name on the wait list for the new GMT or the new Explorer and and however long my name might come up, but I can't get another 5512. These were discontinued before I was born. I love the reference. Um, it's something that I never had the opportunity to buy new. And just the way that vintage Rolex Submariner prices are going, uh, I would, I'd would i be happy to own that one and check back in a few years and see what, yeah. see what the rates are then as yeah. well. I love your pick. Justin? I would too like to choose the 55. 12. However, since Ripley has already made that, <laughs> uh, I'm in a very close running and I'm going to give the nod to nice. the Sky Dweller. Um, like I said before, I love the Sky Dweller as a whole. I love the line. Um, the blue dial is great. Again, I'm wearing one now, so yeah. adding another one and to the collection. And it doesn't have a vintage counterpart. 
you know, it doesn't have a vintage counterpart. Yeah, there there was no um, old Sky Dweller, vintage Sky Dweller. It, you know, it's a it's a relatively new model. Mm -hmm. So if you want one, it's got to be absolutely. And it's kind of two different things. We're choosing, you know, apples versus oranges, right? Like yeah. vintage watches are so great, and you know, I would pick that fifty five twelve up in a second. However, today the Sky Dweller is getting the vote and sticking with it. I love it. Well, as much as I would like to take your road and go maybe to something different, I too am taking the Sky Dweller. Um, for me, especially with just kind of the opportunity to add Jubilee to it now, mm -hmm. um, I would probably go a bit more new with this, if you will, mm -hmm. but uh, I love a blue dial and that Daytona is very tempting to me. That one's it nice is. too, right? That blue very is so. very good looking dial. Yeah, I'd be happy with any of the watches. Yeah, <laughs> for, this lineup for sure. Always tough decisions. <laughs> yeah. I know, I guess for me, I always narrow it down to wearability. So, you know, which one am I going to wear more? And as much mm -hmm. as I think that I'm a sporty person, I still kind of like the dressier style of the Sky Dweller. So, this is getting my vote today. All right, I like it. I know. We only got two up here, but at least we're on the same team. I agree with you. I like it. Great picks. <laughs> All right, well, now that you have our picks, we want to know your picks. Be sure to leave us a note in the comments of what watch from this week's selection you are taking. Um, again, no budget, and I guess no wait list at your AD either. So anyway, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys again soon. Hey everyone, we're back with a new episode of Watch Talk. This week we've got five absolutely standout watches, including some 2021 Rolex models and a vintage Submariner. Don't miss it.